Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. All right. Let's start off today by singing Shabbat shalom together. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat Particularly, I don't know. I just, I just wanted to praise. So, it's good to be here today. Um, good job on those of you who showed up on this wet and dreary day. Um, I always know it's going to be interesting when the weather turns sour. So, it's so good to have everyone here today. Let's go to page ninety-eight. Page 98, the Ain Come Up. You'll have to forgive me. Uh, I led Kabbalah Shabbat last night, and I woke up and my throat was just as dry as it came. And uh, it's passing uh, out much better even after plenty of water. So, the Ain Come Up, page 98. You'll see extra loud to help hide my raspy voice, say. Tematukolahamim, <laughs> Tivne Komot, Yerushala Hayim, Tivne Komot, Yerushala Hayim, Kiva Ka, Levahad Bahatab, Nu, Melech El Ram Bidisam, Adoho no Lamim. There is none like you, Adonai, and there is nothing like your deeds. God, you rule eternally. Your kingdom lasts for all generations. Adonai rules, Adonai rules, Adonai will rule forever and ever. Adonai will give strength to God's people, and I will bless God's people with peace. Merciful Father, favor Zion with your goodness. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, for we trust only you, ruler, God on high, sovereign of worlds. We're going to rise, reopening of the ark, your Kodesh. Whenever the ark would travel, Moses would say, Arise, Adonai, and scatter your enemies. May those that hate you flee from you. For Torah shall come from God, and the word of Adonai from Jerusalem. Blessed is the one who in his holiness gave the Torah to Israel. Praise be the name of the sovereign of the universe. Praise be your crown and your place. May your love for your people Israel last forever. And may the salvation of your right hand be revealed to your people in your holy house. Grant us the goodness of your life and accept our prayer with mercy. May it be your will that we be granted a long good life, and may I be counted among the righteous, so that you will have mercy on me and protect me in all that is mine. 
all that belongs to your people Israel. You are the one who nourishes all and sustains all. You rule over all. You are the one who rules over earthly rulers and sovereignty is yours. I am a servant of the blessed Holy One. I bow before God and before the honor of God's forehead at all times. Not in any human do I trust, nor do I rely on any angel, but in the God of heaven, who is the true God and whose Torah is true, and whose prophets are true, and who multiplies deeds of goodness and truth. In God do I trust, and in God's holy honor and name I speak praises. It may it be your will that you open my heart to Torah and completely answer my heart's desires and those of your people Israel for good, for life, and for peace. Amen. <laughs> Page 102. We'll have to read a response. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Echad Eloheinu Gadol Adonai Kadosh Shamo. Adonai Adonai Eloheinu, Eli, Grayson, I failed you, I'm sorry. That was your key, wasn't it? <laughs> Once you two come up here, and then you can keep on coloring. You may guys may be seated. No, no pushing. You'll each get a turn. Uh, at least they're excited, right? You guys should have seen it. There was, there was like a little, there was like a little match back here. Okay. Oh, you can see it. Very good boy. Okay. So, remind me, what's this book called? The Bible. Right. And can either of you remember the name of God's Son? Uh, Jesus. Good. Good. Last week we got a little confused with our answers, so I'm glad to see they had it this week. Um, <laughs> all right. Yeshua. Jesus, Yeshua. Amen. What's another good question for Eli and Grayson to answer or to learn? What are the fruits of the Spirit? Whoa. Uh, <laughs> I see what? I don't know. Concentrate. What are the fruits of the Spirit? <laughs> I love, Did everyone see? Did everyone hear that? Yes. That was excellent. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. That that deserves a reward for sure. Um, Eric, I have I have I have underestimated the questions they can answer. We need we need to keep working on that. All right. Why don't you two? Pick it up together 
Bench? No. No. Go up there. Uh, 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 that was not together. That was not together. <laughs> together. Okay, put your hands up. Together. There you go. Thank you. Do you know who my best friend is? Uh, Other than Jesus, other than my wife. <laughs> she formed a friendship. Eli, Grayson, my best friend is my brother. So you two should be best friends too, right? I'll give it to you. Come on. 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 We don't have a cone with us today, so Gabriel, can I ask you to play two roles at the same time and come up here and bless the door? Let's go to page 104. Well, that was exciting. Amen. Let's hear tonight, God, Lord of the universe, who chose us from all the nations and gave us the Torah. Pray so you tonight, giver of the Torah. So today, our Torah portion begins in the book of Leviticus, chapter 19. You may go there now, that's by Yikra. What makes this portion kind of unique is this is called Kodeshim. And unlike a lot of Torah portions that are addressed to Aron or just the Kohenim, this is applied to the entirety of the congregation of Israel. And a good word for congregation is Adat. You'll hear it in a minute. Adat B'nai Israel, the congregation of the people of Israel. Amen. Thank you, Gabriel, for being willing to come here and bless the Torah today. We did this for the glory of God. Quick question. Ani Adonai Elohecha. Ani Adonai Elohecha. For those of you who are following along in English, what do you think those three words mean? Okay, so Ani, Ani, Adonai, I am the Lord God. I am the Lord God. How many of us have seen that a lot today in this week's Torah portion? It's there quite a bit. It's like God's identity is intrinsically connected with the holiness of his people. And when we are holy, and when we behave ourselves in a Christ like manner, it sanctifies the name of God. And it regards, he is regarded as holy. So I'm sure Robert will say much more to you in just a moment. As Quentin stated, but a shame, holy one. And it's easy for us to think about that being the Kohenim, the priestly portion of Israel, but it is, as he says, something that's pointed us justice. 
justice, justice and beyond. Justice, that Rabbi Resnick is a dominant theme throughout Leviticus, an aspect of the holiness that must characterize God's people. Hence, when Leviticus introduces a code of holiness in Parashat Kodeshim, it details the justice that is required of Israel and of all of Israel. The code's most famous line envisions a limit, a limit to justice, or perhaps a more profound justice than can be captured by any code. You shall not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. In a word, Torah's vision of holiness, vision of justice is fulfilled. The Torah doesn't imply that all of our grudges are misdirected or that there's never anything to avenge. We will indeed encounter injustice in the course of our lives, and we're normally to join with other nine in the pursuit of justice, but at its heart, the code of holiness focuses not on strict justice, but on love of neighbor. And Adonai reminds us who's ultimately responsible for justice by concluding that instruction with those words, I am the Lord. There is no question. He is the one who will pursue justice in any given situation, but to us, he assigns other responsibilities. In the midst of its detailed rulings about holiness and purity, Leviticus designs to us the task of grace. Yeshua was once teaching about this commandment to your neighbor when a lawyer asked him what was a reasonable enough question, and who is my neighbor? In other words, how much is this commandment going to demand or require of me? A very human reaction. How much justice must I pursue? Leviticus reminds us that strict justice sometimes fails, and when it does, we must relinquish the desire for revenge. Indeed, we cannot even hold a grudge. And I'll venture to say that the grudge hell hurts the holder far more than the object of the grudge itself. Taking up the question, uh, how much, <laughs> who is my neighbor? Yeshua said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him naked and beat him up, then went off leaving him half dead. By coincidence, a priest was coming down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite who reached the place saw him also and passed by on the other side. But a man from Shamron who was traveling came upon him, and when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. So he went up to him, put oil and wine on his wounds and bandaged them. Then he set him on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two days' wages gave them to the innkeeper and said, look after him. And if you spend more than this, I'll pay you back when I return. Of these three, which one seems to you to have been the neighbor of the man who fell among robbers? He answered the one who showed mercy toward him. And Yeshua said, you go and do the same. You go and do as he did. The priest and Levite may have felt they had reason to cross over to the other side. Uh, I have heard that addressed before by the possibility that the priest might have thought he was dead, and a priest was not allowed to be in the presence of a dead body. He became unclean if he was in the presence of a dead body. But did he think, or did he know, well, that he knew that the man was dead? That's the question. They have found the exemption, or perhaps they found the exemption from the command to love your neighbor, or at least they have felt that they did. 
some reason why it doesn't apply in their case or under these circumstances. But you, says Mashiach, says the Messiah, are obligated nonetheless. Your neighbor is the one you encounter in need. Your neighbor is the one you're able to love, not in theory, but through practical and sacrificial action. The lawyer who asked for a command, a limit to the commandment, wanted to justify himself. But the commandment ends with the words, again, I am the Lord, reminding us that its focus is divine, not self-justifying. The entire code of holiness is framed in the same terms. It opens with Adonai's words to Moshe, speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And closes with the instruction, and you shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy. In Leviticus, justice and holiness are closely related. Both are found only in the emulation of God himself, who alone is holy who alone is just. Forgetting this, we can become self-righteous and holier than thou. And that is definitely something to be guarded against. We become people who can see right through you in terms of those we meet who are in need of justice, in need of love and help. But we will never quite do you justice as long as we have such an attitude the justice and holiness of God don't gaze from a distance at the messy realities of life, but gets down in the mud and the blood, actively engages those things. The Samaritan is a despised outsider. There were more reasons than one, I think, why Yeshua used the Samaritan as the good person in the story. He might well have held a grudge against his Jewish neighbors, but instead, he fulfills the Torah far better than their experts do. He washed the wounded man. He hoisted his body upon his donkey, and he dug into his purse to cover his expenses, and all of that is holy in the eyes of God. The priests and Levites have kept their hands clean, not so much. The lawyer asks his question because he wants to justify himself. And in response, Yeshua tells about an outsider, that's in that case the ultimate outsider, who goes beyond self-justification to fill the Torah. The moral for the lawyer and the moral for us today remains go and do the same. Do likewise. Abba, we're so grateful for your love, so thankful. Father, for all that you are and for all that you do. So thankful for this place to which we come. Thankful for each precious brother and sister with whom we gather. And Abba, we pray this morning that once more you would prepare our hearts for the message that Brother Quentin is going to bring. That you instruct us through him, through his use and delights upon the Ruach HaKodesh. Direct us in all that's needful for each of us because each of us does have a purpose and each of us is to be an instrument of justice in our own lives and our own interactions with others. And we pray above all things, Father, that your spirit would guide Quentin and guide us all this morning that you would lead us to the realization that each of us has a purpose. Each of us is an instrument to be used by you to usher in finally that time of true and complete justice upon this earth. So lead us, we pray. And so guide us that from Marshall beyond to the ends of the world, we might proclaim by the living of our lives, Father, as much as by word that Yeshua is Adonai, Yeshua is Lord indeed. Grant us, Father, that ability for we ask it in Yeshua's holy name. Amen and amen.
Has anyone here come back from a long journey, recovered from any kind of illness or any kind of hardship, including childbirth? I didn't think so, I just thought I'd ask. Page 109. And Carol will start us off with a test of scripture pertaining to healing in the ministry of Yeshua. Uh, today's passage, uh, passage comes from Matthew 8, verses 1 through 4. And when he came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. And see, a leper came, a leper came, and bowed before him, saying, Master, if you desire, you are able to make me clean. And stretching out his hand, Yeshua touched him, saying, I desire it clean cleansed and immediately his leprosy was cleansed and Yeshua said to him see mention it to no one but go your way show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moshe commanded as a witness to them and uh, uh, I want to say again uh, we're starting the uh, prayer list from scratch so if you know of someone that needs to be added or uh, someone that needs to be taken off uh, mark it on your list and hand, hand it to me before you leave today if you would please right, page 109 the list one who blessed our ancestor Abraham, Isaac, Jacob Sarah, Rebecca Rachel and Leah Bless and heal. John, John, Mark, Jim, Charles, Henry, Kenneth, Michael, Dan, Todd, Johnny, Gilbert, and Bob. May the Holy One give them support, courage, determination, and patience of spirit. Grant them physical and spiritual wholeness. May God in kindness strengthen and heal them speedily, body and soul together with others who are ill, and let us say amen. 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 Oh God, God you see me. May the Holy Blessed One who blessed our ancestors, Abraham, <clears throat> excuse me, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, bless and heal. May the Holy One give her support, courage, determination, and patience of spirit. Grant Vicki, Maurice, Laura, Jill, Dale Renee, Sonia, Tanya, Vanessa, Ashley, Charlotte, Debbie, Joanne, Juanita, Patricia, Annie, Danny, Teresa, Ashley, and Kathleen. Um, grant them physical and spiritual wholeness. May God in kindness strengthen and heal her speedily, body and soul, together with others who are ill. Let us say amen. Amen. Hear their voice, O God, when they call. Be gracious to them and answer them. Grant them patience, faith, and courage. Never let despair overwhelm them. Grant them of your healing power, so that in vigor of body and mind, they may return to their loved ones for a life of blessing and sustenance. Restore them to God, give them strength. Pray for you, God, Amen. All right, let's go to page 114. Did I say 114? I meant 112. Amen. 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 Alamane, Amaya, Yiparak, 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 Yiparak,
Peace to lost to me the kucha, Riku. Let a long make a wicked of his shirata, two spit hot up and neck a mata, dumb about Amen. 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 Guys, I'm working on slowing it down. Um, just so you know, if that felt more operatic than usual, it's because it was. Let's go to page 114. And please, if I ever forget, just someone, I don't know, whacking or something. Um, page 114, the Zotatura. Let's go ahead and see. Many people choose to point to the Zotatura. It's like fixing our eyes on scripture. The Zotatura, a share some Moshe, Ibnehe Benehe in Israel. Ah, the Adonai, the Moshe. This is the Torah, which Moshe sent before the Israelites as God's word by Moshe's hand. David, David, I ask you for some help with this. And um, John, can I get you to help me, please? Just go ahead and sit down over there. And while we're doing this, um, Nick will guide through the Hot Torah. It is a tree of life for those who hold on to it and those who support it are happy. Its paths are pleasant and all its ways are peaceful. Praise are you, Adonai, our God, ruler of the universe, who has chosen good prophets and was pleased with their words that were spoken in truth. Praise are you, Adonai, who chooses the Torah and Moses your servant, and Israel your people, and the prophets of truth and righteousness. Our after all today is in the book of Amos. Amos chapter 9. We'll begin in verse 7. People of Israel, are you any different from the Ethiopians to me? Ask Adonai. True, I brought Israel up from Egypt, but I also brought the Philistim and Kaphtar and Aram from here. Look, the eyes of Adonai Elohim are on the sinful heathen. I will wipe it off the face of the earth, yet I will not completely destroy the house of Yaakov, says Adonai. For when I give the order, I will shake the house of Israel. And there among all the goyim as one shakes with a sieve, letting no grain fall to the ground. All the sinners among my people who say, Disaster will never overtake us or confront us will die by the sword. When that day comes, I will raise up the fallen sukkah of David. I will close up its gaps, raise up its ruins, and rebuild it as it used to be, so that Israel can possess what is left of Edom, and of all the nations bearing my name, says Adonai, who is doing this. The days will come, says Adonai, when the plowman will overtake the reaper, and the one treading grapes, the one sowing seed, sweet wine will drip down the mountains, and all the hills will flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, they will rebuild and inhabit to the ruined cities. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine, cultivate gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their own soil, no more to be uprooted from their land, which I gave them, says Adonai, your God. Praised are you, Adonai, our God, ruler of the universe, rock of all the worlds, righteous in every generation, the faithful God who says it and it is done, who speaks and it is fulfilled. Robert will now read from our New Testament portion. In the reading this morning from Barit Hadashah, the book of Mike Gahu, the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, I'll be reading this morning from the 12th chapter, <clears throat> and I'll be reading verses 28 through 34. For those who'd like to follow along, that is Matthew chapter 12, beginning at verse 38. 28, I'm sorry. <laughs> hmm. But if I drive out our demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And for context, he has just been accused by the Pharisees of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub. 
of the power of the devil. Again, he says, how can someone break into a strong man's house and make off with his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? After that, he can ransack his house. Those who are not with me are against me, and those who do not gather with me are scattering. Because of this, I tell you that people will be forgiven any sin and blasphemy but blaspheming the Ruach HaKodesh, blaspheming the Holy Spirit, will not be forgiven. One can say something against the Son of Man. You can say something against me and be forgiven. But whoever keeps on speaking against the Ruach HaKodesh will never be forgiven, neither in the Olam Hazay nor in the Olam Haba this present world or the world to come. If you make a tree good, its fruit will be good. And if you make a tree bad, its fruit will be bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. You snakes, how can you say who are evil, evil say anything good for the mouth speaks what overflows from the heart? All of God's words are truth and righteousness. For you are faithful, I deny our God, and your words are trustworthy. Not one word of yours is ever taken back unfulfilled. For you are a dependable and merciful ruler. Praise are you, I deny the God, who is dependable in all of your words. Have mercy on Zion, for she is our life's home. Save the humble so quickly in our day. Praise are you, I deny, who causes Zion and her children to rejoice. Cause us to rejoice, I deny our God, with Elijah the prophet, your servant, and the kingdom of David, your anointed. May he quickly come and gladden our hearts. May no stranger sit on his throne, and may no others inherit his glory. For you vowed to him by your holy name that his light would never be extinguished. Praised are you, Adonai, shield of David. And for your Torah, and for the worship, and for the prophets, and for the Shabbat day that you gave us, Adonai, our God, for holiness and for rest, for glory and splendor. For all of these, Adonai, our God, we thank you and praise you. May your name be praised perpetually forever. Praised are you, Adonai, who sanctifies the Shabbat. We'll continue on page 121. I'd ask that you join with me. This is a prayer for our country. It's been several years since we've seen the level of danger in which our country stands today in more ways than one. Both physical danger and spiritual danger. And our country obviously and definitely needs our prayers. And would you join me in praying? Our God and God of our ancestors, please accept the mercy and our prayer for our land and its government. Teach our leaders the values of your Torah. Help them understand your rules of righteousness so that our land may never lack peace and tranquility, prosperity and freedom. I deny God of the spirits of all flesh. Send your spirit to all the inhabitants of our land and plant love and brotherhood peace and friendship among all the nationalities and faiths who dwell in it. Uproot from their hearts any hatred or enmity, jealousy or rivalry, to fulfill the yearnings of your children who delight in its honor and who desire to see it be a light for all the nations. May it be your will that our land will be a blessing to all the inhabitants of the world and that friendship and freedom will reign between them and that the vision of your prophets will soon be fulfilled. Amen. And as our own nation, Israel, stands in grave need of prayer and intercession, and on page 123, I'd ask that you join with me in this prayer for the state of Israel. Our heavenly parent, rock of Israel and its redeemer, Bless the state of Israel, first flowering of all redemption. Shield it under your loving wings and spread over it your suit of peace. Send your light and truth to its leaders, ministers, and advisors, and guide them rightly with your good advice. Strengthen the hands of the defenders of our holy land and lead them, O God, to deliverance. Crown their efforts with victory. Grant peace to the land and eternal happiness to its inhabitants and let us say, Amen.
right, let's go ahead on over to page 128. We're that bottom paragraph down there. We'll go to page 130. Nick will give uh, translations. But first we sing, praise God, saying for God's name is going to be exalted. God's glory is about the heaven and earth. God has exalted, exalted God's people's might, giving praise to the wise ones. The people of Israel are close to God. Hallelujah. Well, go ahead and open up your first place. Hallelujah, <laughs> Shalom, Ashi Benu Adonai, Elegami Yeshua, 
Let's go ahead and be seated. I meant to tell you that when we close the doors. Um, let's go ahead and sing, close out with the last verse of the book of Romans. It is my personal opinion that many of the books, uh, the letters especially, um, in the Brit Kasha, uh, they begin with songs and they end with songs because we were supposed to start the letter with a song of praise and then we were supposed to close it off with a song of praise. So this is the end of the book of Romans. To the only wise God, uh, to the only wise God, for Yeshua the Messiah, for Yeshua the Messiah, be the glory forever, be the glory forever, be the glory forever, forever. Amen. Thank you to the only wise God. Well, a few people aren't here today who would have liked to have been here, namely right now Janelle. Uh, uh, the lady who usually makes announcements, uh, she's feeling under the weather. And to be a little bit blunt with you, so am I. Um, not quite as badly as her. Uh, my stomach's been kind of bothering me for the last 12 hours. Not badly, don't worry. Um, I think it's really the pizza I ate yesterday. I, I do maintain that. But uh, she's been having some headaches and such, so we probably should have included her in the prayer list, uh, the healing list. But just be aware, uh, she would have liked to have been here today, but she said it wasn't responsible. Um, announcements. <sighs> Pauline, it looks good. I know that you still want to touch this wall up a little bit, so I know there's still things to be done, but it looks good. Um, we are just so impressed. And that's right. You haven't seen this for a while, have you? Looks good. Um, and, uh, so just... Once again, I want to draw attention to it. Um, I don't know why. I know this last week you worked on this part. And it just feels so much more, it feels so complete. And um, I look forward to seeing what you're going to do with your own Kodesh. Uh, lots of good work. Gabriel, thank you for being willing to fill in for Eric today. Um, Gabriel's work, back working the technology and uh, just keeping everything running smoothly. Um, I, I'll let you know something. Um, a couple, maybe a month or two ago now, uh, I was looking at some pictures of some pews in a synagogue in Spain. I thought, what an interesting pew, and I didn't think anything else of it, and I moved on. And the next day, a Shabbat, Pauline said she was laying in bed, and a design for a pew went through her head, unintroduced, and just kind of went in, and she said, huh. And she mentioned it to me, and I said, oh, you mean like this, and I saw her picture later that day. And she said, yes, exactly like that. She'd never seen it. And I had just been looking at that picture. Um, and we prayed about it. We felt like the Lord was going to be sending us some pews. We get them Monday for free. 25. How many of us know how much a pew costs? Hundreds of dollars, sometimes in the $2,000 territory. I looked at the price of pews and said, the Lord's going to send them to us as a gift or we're not going to get them. They've been given to us as a gift. They need to be reupholstered, they need to be restained, that there's there's work. So we're taking them to a workshop area, and we're we've got a guy who says he's gonna do it all. We'll see if he does. But just so you know, the Lord sent us them. And I think that they're going to be very comfortable. Um, I personally prefer pews for a lot of reasons. Uh, one of the name one of the big things is because when you have a pew, you share it with the rest of the congregation. Uh, whereas with a chair, you know, it's, it's kind of like, here's me and here's you, and there's not a lot of, but with a pew, it's togetherness. Um, but we're going to make sure that when we debut them, if you want that word, they're going to look good. They're going to be right. It's not going to be a half-finished project. Um, so just be aware, I'm, I haven't mentioned that until now, because we kind of felt that it was going to come after this. It has, now we're going to start saying, they're coming. Um, if anyone likes to strip wood and stain and do all those things that hurt my arms, uh, come talk to me. Um, I say that, I have a bad case of tennis elbow. It's been going on for how long now? Two months? Um, so just be aware of that's, that's happening. We are still talking about starting up a tutoring center here in August, and it seems that we're pretty close to it. Uh, I would have spoken to Janelle about it. We would have probably discussed it a lot more. 
but we weren't able to because she's not feeling well. So we'll say that for next week. Shavuot is in 30 days. Um, could someone get me the date on that, actually? It is on Saturday, it's on a Sunday morning, so we'll probably keep the back sanctuary open for prayers. But for me, the real observance of Shavuot is the night before. For us, it'll be a Saturday night. And what we're going to have is free study time. We study as, er, as late tonight as possible. Last year, we made it to midnight, and then Brant and I spoke till about two. Um, this did come with the advent of coffee uh, in Israel that we find traditions like this began. That's not a coincidence. Uh, that's absolutely uh, a cause and effect. So be aware that it's coming. Yes. Saturday, June 4th, Monday, June 6th. Thank you. June 4th, that's Saturday night. I hope by next week I'll have a list of questions that we're going to discuss at different times. And so it's going to be just discussion time, lots of resources, people will be there studying. We'll see how late we can go. Um, the other great tradition that I love associated with this time is dairy and blintzes. Always need an excuse to eat more blintzes. Um, just so you're aware, uh, that's happening. And then of course we'll have Saturday morning, which Shavuot has another name. What is that name? Pentecost. Pentecost. So we might choose to worship with one of the churches that meets here on Sunday morning, or we might just say, we'll just do our prayers in the back. It's either one. Uh, we'll see kind of, I'm talking to the other pastors, and we'll just see what we, uh, what they feel comfortable with. All right, I think that's all the announcements I can think of offhand. I think that's good. Am I forgetting anything? I don't think I am. Not for now. All right. Let's go to Vayikra, chapter 19, Leviticus 19. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for the explication of your word. Father, we pray that we read and teach it in a worthy manner, one that is true to who you are and edifying to the body. Amen. So I've been talking about this Torah portion for a while now because sometimes Akare Bot is combined with Kodashim. And you have kind of a double joint um, uh, tour portion. And something I always like to say is that when we see titles, that's usually because there's a little bit of wisdom hidden in the title. Now, it's true, usually we pick a unique word from the first verse and we make that the title. But that verse was picked strategically. And we talked about this earlier this week, actually two weeks ago, when we had uh, Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day. And I said, Akre Mot Kedushim, after the death, holiness. And how we commemorate those who've gone before us. And how we talk about the saints who have gone before us and all the martyrs and everyone who's come before and sanctified the name. Indeed, Ecclesiastes 7 says that it is better in the house of mourning than in the house of rejoicing. When's the last time we voluntarily just went to a cemetery and had our devotion there? It's something worth thinking about. I say it because I was praying, I felt like the Lord told me to do just that recently, and I did, and it was actually strangely enlightening. Because you see, what we do here is one of the few things that doesn't end at death. Worship, praise, being with the holy congregation, with the community. These things leave legacy that continue. Most things end at death. And what I like to say is, I'm going to say something that might surprise us. But Yeshua died to make us holy. Why might that be surprising? That seems incredibly obvious. Well, we all agree that his righteousness went on our soul so that we can stand before the Father. That's, that's common knowledge. But what he did is he changed our internal nature. We were once slaves to sin, and now he's made us slaves to righteousness. And so because we are saved, because we're called by his name, because we are free from sin, 
we are actually empowered through that death to live holy lives, to live like him. And part of the good news of salvation is we do not have to sin anymore. Kudashim, holy ones. I'd like to talk about this because I feel that the Holy Spirit may have worked something into the structure of these titles. And it's not perfect, it's not a one for one, but I find it interesting. So let's go on over to Vayikra chapter 12. Tazria. Tazria. What does Tazria mean? Does anyone have that in their scripture? She conceives. Notice it doesn't say when she conceives or if she conceives, but it says a woman will, or a wo when the woman conceives. It's specific. It's strange language. And the rabbis of old did say that this is a reference to the Messiah because it's specific language. And they saw it as the woman is Israel, the virgin Israel, when she brings forth the Messiah, the Shia. So when she conceives, then page 14, I'm sorry, chapter 14, we have Mitzorah, the person afflicted with Sa'arat. And this is interesting to me as well, because you see, the Messiah carries that unique title, the leper king. You see, we have a Messiah who, after he was conceived, took on our leprosy. He took on our illness. He took on our sinful condition. But here's the catch. He didn't sin. Sinful human flesh didn't sin. The ancient church fathers, and this is changing the tone, the church fathers told this parable about the incarnation of our master. They said it's like a doctor who has patients he cannot cure. So he took on their illness and developed within himself the antibodies, they didn't use that word, but it's the idea, the cure for the disease. And then he took parts of himself and gave it to his patients in order to bring out the healing in them. To put it in today's vernacular, it's the vaccine. It's the cure to our condition. Because the scripture makes it very clear that old sacrifices could not change who we are. The book of Hebrews says that the old sacrifices offered year after year could not cleanse the conscience of the worshiper. In chapter 10, verse 4, it says that the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. But we see God forgives all the time in the Old Testament. What happened to Nineveh? What happened to David? Did God forgive them? God forgave them, but their nature wasn't changed. The sin, sinful nature, was still there. They, the contamination, remained. And what God did through the incarnation of his son is he provided the cure for sin. I've got good news for you, beloved. We don't have to sin anymore. How many of us have heard that pitch when sharing the gospel? Usually I'm hearing about streets of gold or relationship with God or God's wonderful will for your life. Good news, you don't have to sin anymore. The problem was sin. The problem has been addressed. And what comes after Sa'arat, leprosy, after the death, holiness. Now, am I completely reading into this? Possibly. But it sure is interesting. She conceives Sa'arat, Akramot um, Kodashim. She conceives the leper, and after death, holiness. I think the next one is actually interesting, too. And more, not really. Speak on the mount by my regulation. Okay, that could be something. Um, I don't want to take it too far, because we have been commissioned. Father, I am praying that everyone here is given, we have the key. But Lord, I pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have victory over sin and by the power of the blood. You see, the book of Revelation says that the saints overcame by the word of their testimony. And what else? By the blood of the Lamb. 
Yeshua died to make us holy. Yeshua gave his life on the tree to make us holy. We are expected, no, called. It would be an insult to his death and resurrection and to our calling if we still live entrapped by sin. Does anyone have any thoughts they'd like to share about this before we start to move on? And I'm not going to sit up here and tell you that if you're still struggling with sin, that you're wrong. Because there's a word for that. It's called spiritual pride. It's spiritual abuse if I said things like that. The truth is, I struggle with sin too. We're going to keep on having the struggle, but the good news is, it's been defeated and the cure has been put into our spirits. So let's live like holy people. I want to talk about this because this is important. Because I see a lot of defeated Christianity. I don't really see a lot of defeated Messianic Judaism. The truth of the matter is, I don't usually hear these things talked about. Usually when I'm in Messianic Jewish circles, I'm hearing about prophecy. Of, I'm hearing about all sorts of things, but I'm not hearing about the very practical, how do we defeat sin? How do we live as holy ones? It's through the Holy Spirit. Scripture says that when he went on high, he gave gifts to men. He gave us the Holy Spirit. He couldn't give the Holy Spirit until after he'd been glorified. Why? Because Yeshua had to go against every type of sin in existence and develop within himself a cure to every single sin. He had to beat them all. And after he beat them all, does anyone know what round robin is? You know, when you have, like, soccer, two people compete over here, or two teams, two teams, two teams, you take the losers, the, the winners go, and it, it goes up, and then you have a champion at the at, when they win the final round. That's normal. Round robin is different, where every team plays against every team, and when you have a champion there, you have a definitive winner. Because the first best may have actually beat the second best in the first round, but we will never know. Round robin, you go against everybody. And when you emerge the champion, you are the true champion. Yeshua went round robin against sin, so that you can have victory against every kind of sin known to man, including torture and death. So if there's a situation, if there's a situation, he has been exposed to it so that he could give you the keys to overcome it. Notice that I didn't say poverty was one of them. Okay? Very often when I hear about overcomer, I hear it linked with prosperity. The prosperity gospel. You're going to be an overcomer in this lifetime. The book of Revelation makes it incredibly clear that being an overcomer means overcoming sin. And he's willing to provide and happy to provide everything else if he gave us his son. But it is not a part of the covenant made at the cross. That's just his good and gracious nature. It is an insult and it is a crime to live continued to be dominated by sin. Sin, willful, flagrant sin. And when I look at Leviticus 19, I see all sorts of things that pertain to how you treat other people. I think my personal favorite is do not set an obstacle in the way of a blind person. Fear your God, I am not an eye. Not only is that just an absolute low, putting an obstacle in front of a blind person, but it is actually a spiritual mitzvah. Because it pertains to the physical. Yes, that's right. Don't put a chair in front of the blind person because that's, that's awful. But also, don't cause spiritual hindrance. In fact, all of these, you could say, pertain to the spiritual. Just commands here against gossip. Do not hate your brother in your heart, but rebuke. Don't take vengeance. Observe my regulations. <clears throat> Rules pertaining to sexual morality. How do you treat family? Keep my Shabbat. Revere my sanctuary. How do we treat God? How do we treat other people? There, I have read commentaries that try to put this into an order. And there is an order, somewhat. But I think that for me, there's a lot more of an intermingling between how we treat other people and how we treat God, because those two are not separable. 
I was talking earlier this week in the Torah Club, and then I said it again last night. I think once I say something, I get stuck on it for a week until I'm forced to read the next Torah portion, and then I get stuck on something else. So for those of you who've been paying attention, I've been saying this a lot. But Yeshua says that the world will know us by the way we love who? Each other. Yes. The love we have for the body of Messiah dictates whether or not the world will be able to recognize us. Notice he didn't say the love we have for the world, the love we have for our unsafe neighbor. We have a love for them. God loves them. We love them too. But the love for the people of God is unique. Scripture says that we cannot hate our brother and still claim to be in the light. If we hate our brother and we claim to be in the light, in the light we are liars and we deceive ourselves. We are still in darkness. There's a special love that is owed to my spiritual brothers and sisters that is not owed to the outsider. And let me restate this. This does not mean we hate anyone or hold any grudges or have unforgiveness toward the non-believer, but the love we have for each other is special. Okay? Black, white, yellow, blue, I don't care. If you belong to Christ, we're a family. Amen. Yes. If you don't belong to Christ, you could be my actual physical brother, and you're not as related to me as the spiritual congregation. The love you have for each other says more about God and sanctifying his name than this Ani Adonai Elohechem, him being the Lord your God and Kudashim and Holy Ones than anything else. It's the love you have for the people of God. And that's important. That is so important. Because I've seen, because I've grown up in churches and Messianic Jewish congregations. And I differentiate those two just on the basis of cultural differences, not spiritual differences or even as a matter of conviction. But let's be real, Messianic Jewish congregations are different than Sunday churches just in their method of worship. So that's why I differentiate these two so often. But How many of us have seen churches or Messianic Jewish congregations where everyone hates each other? How many of us have seen a church tear itself to pieces because they, the body hated each other? I tell you, when I first took over as congregational leader in 2017, most of the congregation whew, scattered. And it wasn't out of great loyalty to the man before me. They treated him badly too. Um, but when Quentin came in and he went to pray the Amidah, well, that was just too far. I'm not exaggerating. And I remember one Shabbat where there were eight people in here, including me, Inessa, who became my future wife, my mom, my dad, Robert, and his wife. That means there are two people who are not immediately related to us. And the insults and the slanders I had to endure, I had people screaming at me. And I said, well, I said so many things because so many things were said to me. But what I said then, and kind of my, my the grievances that were found with us in this congregation was number one, I found that a lot of the things I said insulted people because I taught a lot against sin. Um, that puts me in a completely positive light, but I hate to say that's what we did. We taught against sin. And I had people come up to me afterwards and say, that can't possibly be right, what you said, and I would never see them again. But the other thing I said, and this is what I've been saying for a couple weeks, and I want to draw in, is that we are fanatically pro-Yeshua. And that if I'm going to stand up here behind this Amud, wearing a tallit, reading scripture to you, and teaching scripture, that everything I say will be brought back through the lens and teachings of either Yeshua or his 12 apostles. Okay? It, that's not hard. I even made a poster about it in the back. The four Messianic values. The first one is the, the teachings of the apostles, aka the New Testament. I say this because 
And the reason for it, and this was the congregation before I took over, very, very much of it, not all of it, of course, but very much of it, and I've seen this everywhere, is that Messianic Jewish congregations are unique to getting stuck in ruts and traps. People get fanatical about obscure part points of doctrine, and they try to say, well, now I'm Messianic Jewish. I don't see the parallel. I don't see the cause and effect. And so I was getting hounded by people who did not like certain things about Sunday church or about fill in the blank. I, I just feel like it was fast and it was strange, just the sheer amount of things people could get obsessed over. Like I mentioned one two weeks ago, alternate calendars. Or like last week I said, sacred name movement. I had one man who told me that I was in dangerous territory because I refused to pronounce God's name according to the letters. And then he kind of, in a sideways way, said, I pronounce a curse on all the sons of Edom who claim to be Jews. Ashkenazi Jews. Um, that's what he did. And, of course, he didn't say it against me, because that would be obvious, but he said, a curse upon me who calls himself a Jew, but doesn't do it, or but doesn't observe the letters of the name. Or, Stupid. And, actually, that's why I went on a rant here. And here's my thing, and can I please give us this? Do we want to be holy ones? Do we want to be the Kudashim that Yeshua called us to be? Then here are my rules. Number one, a fanatical dedication to the Messiah. A fanatical dedication to the Messiah. If I'm a Talmud, then I sit for years immersing myself in the words of my rabbi so that I can repeat the words of my rabbi. And if I am a fully trained disciple, that's what Talmud is, disciple, then I will talk and carry myself like my rabbi. People, let's be like our rabbi, Yeshua, the Messiah. I don't care if you come up here saying, well, Michael Rood says this, or I've heard someone on YouTube say this, or I heard a guy in Israel say this, or fill the blank, I've heard them all. Can we take it back to Yeshua? Can we take it back to him? And if we can't take it back to him, then it might be good, but it's not worth me building a doctrine on. And when I say Yeshua, I'm counting the 12 apostles on that as well. For me, the New, the New Testament is the teachings of Yeshua. And so there's many things in the Torah which I can get distracted on, or I can start to say, well, this is how we should be, or we should do this. And I'll say, okay, that's great. Did, did Yeshua say this? Did Yeshua observe an alternate Shabbat? There's a myth, there's, there's a... I recently beheld a Hebrew roots congregation that tore itself apart because they couldn't agree on the day of the Shabbat. I kid you not. Yeshua observed Shabbat with the rest of Israel in Luke chapter 4, verse 16. So even if for some reason the Shabbat is wrong, Yeshua didn't seem to start these arguments, so neither will I. Hold me accountable to the words of Yeshua. Hold me accountable to being like his congregation. Hold me accountable to being like his apostles, because that's what we immerse ourselves into, the teachings of the apostles. Because they're the ones who relay the instructions of Yeshua to us. And so, what do I do? I want to take us to a passage of scripture. Let's go to Acts 21.17. No one's no one screen, okay? Uh, for those of you who have been here for a while, you know that I taught, like, forever about Acts 21, 17. Forever. I never stopped. In fact, I have made a poster about Acts 21, 17. I just haven't made it yet. Because I feel for our congregation, what makes us unique is Acts 21, 17. Let's read it together. In Jerusalem, the brothers received us warmly. The next day, Shaul and the rest of us went to see Yaakov, and all the elders were present. This probably includes the twelve apostles. After greeting them, Shaul described in detail each of the things that God had done among the Goyim through his efforts. On hearing it, they praised God, but they also said to him, You see, brother, how many tens of thousands of believers there are among the Judeans, and they are all zealots for the Torah. Now they have been told about you, and uh, I'm sorry, now what they have been told about you is that you are teaching all the Jews living among the Goyim, the Gentiles, to apostatize from Moshe telling them not to have brit milah, that's circumcision, for their sons and not to follow the traditions. 
What then is to be done? They are certain to, to hear that you have come, so do what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take them with you, be purified with them, and pay their expenses, connected with shape, having their heads shaved. Then everyone will know that there is nothing to these rumors that have been heard about you, but that, on the contrary, you yourself stay in line and keep the Torah. However, in regards to the Goyim, the Gentiles who have come to trust in Yeshua, we, have, uh, we all joined in writing a letter with our, discuss, or with our decision that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, from blood, what has been strangled, and from fornication. In other words, sexual immorality. That's a broad term. The next day, Shaul took the man, purified himself along with them, and entered into the temple to give notice of when the period of purification would be finished and when the offering would have to be made for each of them. There's a poster over there of the temple. And I can point out to you later on, but there's a little chamber where this would have happened where they offered the hare sacrifice. Um, it was the court of the Nazarites, and it was where they took off all the hair on their bodies. And for a period of time, that hair what, that they grew was a special offering dedicated to God. So all the hair on my body now is being grown for God, and it will be offered as a sacrifice. That's the vow of the Nazarite. And we broke this down in excruciating detail. But I'm going to give you the short version. This is the original Messianic Jewish community started by Yeshua. It has been allowed to grow. Okay, we saw in the early parts of Acts, we saw in Acts 15. Then we, the book of Acts follows Paul on his missionary journey. He comes back to Jerusalem, and my word, how it's grown. We are now at the tens of thousands of level, myriads upon myriads. And it's a culture shock from where we were earlier. Because we've been in the Gentile land so much that we're coming back and it's like, whoa, now it's time to offer a sacrifice. And he goes and stands before the elders. And Paul says that he presented his gospel before the elders to make sure his grace had not been run in vain. In other words, even Paul, the great Paul, submitted his gospel before the twelve apostles because he recognized their authority. And of course, they give him the right hand of fellowship. The twelve apostles approved Paul and said that he was legitimate. Not to make a new rabbit trail, but there are some in the Messianic movement who have fallen under the persuasion that Paul was a false prophet. I would say that he's not a false prophet, but he addresses a, of course not, but he addresses a completely different set of needs than what we see in the Messianic Jewish world, because he is working in the Gentile world. And the thing about the gospel is it had to stay mobile and it had to stay fluid in order to be able to reach the Jewish uh, the, to reach the Gentile world. In the Jewish world, it could stay a little bit more within the confines of culture, within the confines of scripture. And that's why we see things like the Nazarite vow. These elders no doubt included the twelve disciples, but we see that they have a kind of president among them, uh, if that's the right term. Yahakov, the brother of Yeshua. How many of us know that in church history, Church history, church historians tell us that Yaakov had a title. He was Yaakov Jacob the Righteous. Or in Hebrew, Yaakov Hasadik. That's what we call an incredibly holy man that we are commemorating. He is saying before Yaakov Hasadik, Jacob the Righteous. And I want to give us an idea of what this man was like. According to church histor historians, um, Yaakov spent his entire day just in the temple. He was so revered by the common person that they allowed him into the priest court right next to the building. That's how much he was revered. He spent his day wearing linen because he was an Essene. He was a lifelong Nazarite. Anyone know this about Yaakov? The Bible doesn't really talk about him or what his role is, but church historians captured a lot of it. A lifelong Nazarite, highly revered by the people. And this is weird too. The ancient sages and rabbis agreed that they had great reverence for Simon Peter. I kid you not. Up until about the 3rd or 4th century, everyone spoke well of who they called Kepha the poet. Peter the poet. And they said he was a disciple of Yeshua. And even if they didn't believe Yeshua was Messiah, they had great reverence for him, uh, for Peter. In fact, he wrote a song called the Nishmat, which is sung on Shabbat morning. Uh, in many Sidurim. We don't have that one in our Sidur, but I wish we did. So that's some context about this early community. They had good standing 
in the Jewish community. And this breaks my heart. This breaks my heart because so much of the Messianic Jewish community has done things to separate themselves from the Jewish community of arbitrary issues. What's this? That's a CC. Has anyone ever here ever seen a weird CC with gold and purple? Or non-kosher blue? Yes. Has anyone ever seen it attached to belt loops? Or attached to a shirt? Yeah. Not Tali Katan, that's fine. A shirt. Or a keychain or a backpack. I have, I have, I have, I have, I have. Weird distinctions that are not biblical, but only put more barriers between the average Messianic Jew and the rest of the Jewish community. And I say this because I used to live in Yerushalayim, and I, unfortunately, when I saw missionaries, street preachers, this was the type of thing that I saw a lot of. Let's go to Yerushalayim and argue with the rabbis about the Sabbath and how to observe the Sabbath. Oh my word, who cares? <laughs> These things are not what are central. Yeshua didn't start arguments that I've had to hear firsthand. We have stopped representing Yeshua and the original 12 apostles who had standing in the Jewish community were able to function in temple worship. Here they are participating in the Nazarite vow. In Acts chapter three, verse one, we see that Peter went to the temple at the hour of praying the Amidah. You see, they did not draw arbitrary distinctions, but they did build their lives off the teachings and words of the Master Yeshua, the Messiah. When I stand here before you today, I see ourselves as a continuation of that Acts 21 congregation. Maybe you could say a resurrected Acts 21 congregation. And I want so badly to fall in line with what I'm seeing here. There are entire ministries, if you want to call them that, just bashing the Talmud. Talmud Bavi, or sages. And while I am definitely open to discussing those things, Yeshua never, as a whole, discounted the oral law. He definitely brought parts of it to question, but we also see him adhering to parts of it. Nor did the did these, the, this congregation. In fact, Paul was accused of telling the Jews among the diaspora not to circumcise and not to follow the traditions. Not the scripture, the traditions. Have we fallen in line with Paul's accusers who are going to cause a riot in the temple in a little bit and have him arrested? And even though Paul says he has done nothing against the Jewish nation or the traditions of the fathers. I see a fanatically holy community when I see Acts 21. They are true Kodeshim. It is good for me to constantly bring passages of scripture like this to our attention. Because if I'm going to build my life off of anything, it better be the words of scripture. Especially the words of the Messiah and those 12 apostles who recorded all those words, and those teachings, and created the congregations that we see today. I'm going to try as close as possible to follow the instructions and the examples given to us in scripture. And so I have to look at it and say, okay, where did Yeshua start arguments? That's where I'll start arguments. Where did Yeshua not start arguments? That's where I will not start arguments. Did Yeshua invent new seat seat? No? Okay, then I'll toss that one out. Did Yeshua keep alternate holidays? No? Toss that one out. Did Yeshua care very much about justice and how the stranger was treated? Yes. Okay, I'll talk about that one. Did Yeshua take care of the widow and orphan? Yes. Okay, I'll take care of that one. Did he teach the gospel? Yes. I'll teach the gospel. Did he teach against sin? Yes, let's teach against sin. Did he live a holy lifestyle? Yes, then let's live a holy lifestyle. Let's live like our master. And where I don't see him living, I don't care. But where I do see him giving arguments and living, that's what I care about. And I want to be holy like he is holy. So join with me in imitating and following my master, Yeshua, the Messiah. That is the key to holiness. This Tully doesn't get along today. It never does. Do you want to be holy? Do you want to live victory over sin? Let's found who we are in Scripture. 
Acts 21, 17 gives a wonderful example of that first century community. We don't see them going around restoring the name. We don't see them going around starting new temples, starting alternate prayers, starting the correct way to do the Nazarite vow. We just see them living and thriving within the Jewish community, serving Yeshua and declaring his name. That there are myriads and myriads who are zealous for him and zealous for the law. Let me ask you a question. Are you zealous for Yeshua? Don't be quick, too quick to say yes or no. Think about it. What we do here, can we trace it back to him? Does it look like that Acts 21 community? I know I've gone on really long today. The perfect sermon is like matzah. It doesn't last more than 18 minutes. <laughs> but I need to reiterate this. Because this is actually the text that we built this congregation on, Acts 21, second verse 17. I was asked in the early days, can you do nothing but quote Jesus? I can't believe I was actually asked that. All you can do is quote Jesus, isn't it? Well, yes, thank you. He's my Lord, and he's my Savior. And I am basing my life off of him. And for everything else, let's just agree that it's secondary. At best. Third, or fourth, or inconsequential at worst. But at best, let's have grace and allow things to be secondary. And so if you're claiming the name of Yeshua, if you're teaching the gospel, if you're living in victory over sin, welcome, you're a part of the Kodashim, as far as I can tell, the Holy Ones. Let's keep on striving toward that and growing in it. Amen. Gabriel. Uh, Shaul told the um, the going in, in uh, Corinth, he said, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Right there, he says it. You have been given the victory over sin. You will not be tempted more than you can bear, and when you are tempted, you are given the method of escape. Congratulations, that's why you should have To provide that way of escape for you. Anyone else before we close out today? Another one I like, and you trigger my memory, is where Paul says, uh, giving a list of people, and he uh, who will come in the end times, and he says, they have a form of godliness, but lack the power thereof. What does that mean? Does that mean they don't speak in tongues? Well, in context, it's lack of power over sin. And that if they were truly following God, they would have that power over sin. Because he's given us the way out. Let's go to page 162. Acts 21 is very important in who we are. I used to have a reader response reading that I did with the congregation on Shabbat just to reiterate those congregational values every single week and to trace it back into scripture. I might bring that back one day because it's just that important. Um, the truth of the matter is I think people got tired of hearing me talk about Acts 21. But that is our true sample of the Messianic Jewish community. Other places we hear words about it, but there we actually see it. Page 162, the Ink Hello Hangu. Ink Hello Hangu, Ink Adonayu, Ink Hello Hangu, Ink Moshi Hangu, Ink Hello Hangu, Ink Adonayu, Ink Amahangu, Ink Moshi Hangu, No De Lelo Hangu, No De Adonayu, No De Lelo Hangu, No De Lelo Moshi Hangu. Baruch Eloheinu, Baruch Adonai, Baruch Makainu, Baruch Moshiainu. Atahu Eloheinu, Atahu Adonai, Atahu Makainu, Atahu Moshiainu. Atahu Shetiru, Avotainu, Levanega Ekorta Samim. Page 166, the musical note. 
the prophet Zechariah said, then God will be ruler over all the earth. On that day, God will be one in God's name. One. Ve'ne'emar v'haya Adonai l'melech ha'aretz v'yom ha'bu v'yom ha'bu g'yet Adonai echad u'shemo'o 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 echad The Morris Kaddish, page 168. I have some names in front of me. Paul Gillett, Scott Florida. Uh, sorry. My first name is Barry, Lori, Phelan, and William. If you're born in the loss of a loved one somewhere in the last 11 months, or coming up on a one year anniversary, you may stand up and say this with me. Three in the back. People may stand up and uh, pray this with them in solidarity if they like. Yikna Viknash Shemei Rabba. Amen. I'm sorry, I should restate that. Would you guys like, would any of you like to lead the prayer? No. No? Okay. Just making sure. Well, sorry, Barbara. Yikna Viknash Shemei Rabba. Amen. Amen. Say shalom, be Ramah, who you say shalom, holy you, and they call Israel, be Ru, amen. amen. May there be abundant peace from heaven and light for us and for all Israel, and say amen. May the one who makes peace in the high places make peace for us and for all Israel, and say amen. amen. We have Hebrew class at one o'clock, assuming it's not past one. May you go out in the grace and peace of our master Yeshua the Messiah, you are his